This is astronaut Edward White on an air-bearing trainer preparing for his extravehicular maneuvers during the Gemini 4 mission. If man is to progress in the exploration and utilization of space, he must be able to function outside his spacecraft. New experiments can be performed. Manned orbiting laboratories or space stations can be constructed in orbit. Repairs to spacecraft and satellites can be made. Alternate methods of docking and crew transfer can be effected. Before this can come about, there is much to be learned about our technology, about the space environment, about man himself. The technology to support a man during extravehicular activity required the development of a special suit. The normal Gemini flight suit consists of four layers of material to provide comfort and pressure control. The EVA suit is built up of alternate layers of aluminized mylar and non-woven dacron for thermal control, thick felt for micrometeoroid protection, and an outer covering of white reflective nylon. Boots and gloves worn over the normal flight articles provide additional protection. The EVA suit weighs 34 pounds compared to the 24 pounds of the regular suit. A double zipper closes the suit, a pressure sealing zipper and a second one to take the strain off the pressure zipper. In addition to the regular helmet visor, a gold-tinted, high-strength overvisor protects the eyes from the intense solar radiation beyond Earth's atmosphere. Special fittings on the suit allow attachment of the umbilical. The umbilical contains an oxygen supply hose from the spacecraft environmental control system, electrical leads for biomedical monitoring and communications, and a nylon tether. While the umbilical is 25 feet long, the tether is 23 and a half feet and takes all loadings. Its tensile strength is 1,000 pounds. An emergency life support pack is worn on the chest and provides a continuous oxygen supply for nine to nine and a half minutes. It attaches to the parachute harness. The emergency oxygen line feeds through the drinking port in the helmet. A pressure gauge shows the astronaut the oxygen remaining in the system. A switch can be thrown by the astronaut to provide oxygen in case of umbilical supply failure. To provide translation and attitude control, the astronaut uses a handheld maneuvering unit. Compressed oxygen is expelled through twin nozzles pointing to the rear or through a single forward nozzle to provide propulsion and braking power. With the qualification of this equipment and the training of the astronaut, the United States manned spaceflight program was ready for its first experiments in extravehicular activity. During the third orbit of the Gemini 4 mission, after a careful checkout, pilot Edward White received the order from command pilot McDivitt to begin the experiment. Astronaut White tells of the experience. When I, prior to going out, I thought, what do you say to 194 million people when you're looking down at them from, from space. And this flashed through my head as I got out. It, I had thought about it before. They had cautioned me, he said, you're going to be on live radio and live TV. And I, uh, I honestly couldn't think of what I really should say. And the solution became very obvious to me as I stepped out. I said, they don't want me to talk to them from up here. They want to hear what we're doing up here while we're actually going through the missions. And I was waiting for the go. It came a little earlier than I had expected. I was expecting it to get it over Guaymas. I thought maybe I'd lost track of time out there, that uh, it was going faster than I had anticipated. But as we look back and on the flight plan, uh, Chris actually felt we were ready to go over Hawaii, and that since we were going to lose a portion of the nighttime on the other end of the uh, EVA due to the late launch, he decided to let us go over Hawaii. So I got my go a little earlier than I anticipated. At this time, I 
wanted to be sure that camera was going. We felt it was very important, so I dismounted it again, turned it on, looked at it to be sure it was running, and mounted it back up there again. This was my first big effort of the day. I really had a little bit of trouble mounting the camera back there again, and it started jiggling around, and the films actually show the first part of it, the camera's bouncing up and down like that. Well, that's not the spacecraft. Jim had that spacecraft as steady as a rock. It was me trying to mount the camera in the bracket behind the door. And in fact, this is one time where Jim, one of the times Jim cautioned me out there, he said, hey, uh, you're starting to breathe pretty hard. And I, I said, I know, but I'm trying to mount the camera out here. I, I'm not, uh, not tiring myself too much. But I did realize I was uh, putting out for the first time during the EVA exercise. This is actually the egress. This is actually when I'm coming out. What I had tried to do was actually fly to actually fly with the gun or maneuver with the gun right out of the spacecraft. And when I departed the spacecraft this time, there was no push off whatsoever from the spacecraft. The gun actually provided the impulse for me to leave the spacecraft. The first time I tried to come out, there I go. All right, now I'm, I'm leaving and it's under the influence of the gun. I'm trying to maneuver over to my left so I would be in front of Jim's window. I maneuvered approximately down the center line of the spacecraft, perhaps favoring just a little on the right. But the gun is actually providing the impulse for my maneuvers. I've started a yaw around to the left with the gun. At this time, I knew we had something with the gun because it was actually providing me an opportunity to, to control myself where I wanted to go out there. The uh, control was actually what we were trying to demonstrate on our EVA operation. We uh, we knew a little bit about the tether dynamics, but we wanted to actually find out how well could a man outside a spacecraft with a maneuvering unit control himself. And in later parts, we wanted to find out just how well could the man control himself uh, with a tether also. It looks like uh, right now I've started to float up, and uh, this is the influence of the tether. It always tried to drift me up above the spacecraft, away from the area that I wanted to be in. I think at this time I was translating back toward the spacecraft. I came back toward the spacecraft, up over the hatch, turned around above the spacecraft, out of the view of the cameras, and uh, this time I told Jim I was coming back again uh, out in front of the spacecraft to see if we couldn't be sure that we could record it on the cameras. This is the section that I uh, recall I should come in from the left side. There it is, I see it. I'm coming in now, and I went out in front of the spacecraft at this time and actually made a yaw either direction. I found that the control with the gun to the right and to the left was what I felt quite adequate, and the pitch was quite adequate. I only had six feet per second in the gun, which is a very limited amount of air, so I tried to use it very sparingly. I just used it enough to satisfy myself and to make maneuvers so that I felt in my own mind that I could control myself in both pitch, yaw, and translation. This is the type of control that you need to move from point A to point B in space. If you can control your pitch and your yaw and translate fore and aft, you can actually go from point A to B uh, roll really isn't very important. The roll didn't bother me. I wasn't trying to control myself in roll because we don't really care about the roll as long as the pointing direction is uh, accurate. On this one, I used the tether to come back into the spacecraft. You can see my arms right now actually moving the tether back and forth and it doesn't provide a great deal of control. This was the first time I realized that we'd mounted the tether in a position that wasn't optimum to operate in the area that I had wanted to. It continually put me above the spacecraft, perpendicular to the surface from which the tether was attached. The tether being attached at this point always tended to pivot me. I'd go out this way, and then it would pivot me right back in the area that I didn't want to be in, which was back around the adapter section of the spacecraft. It was pretty interesting, though. I, I didn't mind getting back on the adapter uh, section. I was able to actually take a look at the thruster areas. The plumes of the thrusters, as Jim was firing them to stabilize the spacecraft, looked just the way uh, uh, Mr. Chamberlain told me they would look. They 
came out about a foot and a half or two feet from the spacecraft and uh, it didn't look very ominous at all. This area, the foot and a half to two feet, was an area in which they felt the heat would damage my suit. I was right above them, about five or six feet above them, watching them fire at one time. Right now, I'm actually uh, working with the tether only. I'm not working with the gun. It ran out after my second translation out in front of the spacecraft and back. And this was the time I had made the statement, I sure wish I had a little bit more uh, fuel for my gun. Uh, this was a time when I got right out by the nose and looked down at the nose. We'd uh, thought that I might get out there and, and actually see if I could hold on to the nose and Jim translate the spacecraft. But I got out there, took one look at the stub antenna, which was our connection with radio back to the Earth, and I felt this wasn't any place to play around with. And so I didn't do any work around the nose of the spacecraft. I pushed off and went on out uh, further. When you push off the spacecraft with the tether, uh, it's very difficult to push off exactly in the direction you want to go unless the surface of the spacecraft is perpendicular. So you see, when I pushed off, it put a nice big rolling uh, motion to me, and I'm using the tether now to pull myself back in to the spacecraft. The tether was uh, quite, quite useful. I was able to go right back where I started every time, but I wasn't able to maneuver to a specific point with it. Uh, another use of the tether that Jim uh, mentioned to me was I actually used it to pull myself down on the spacecraft, and at one time I called down and said I'm actually walking across the top of the spacecraft, and this is exactly what I was doing. I took the tether pulled myself down on the spacecraft to give myself a little friction on the top of the spacecraft and walked about three or four steps until the angle of the tether to the spacecraft got so much that uh, my feet went out from under me. But I was able to actually walk right up the spacecraft. Astronaut White experienced no disorientation whatsoever and was able to move from point to point and control his attitude. The performance of these extravehicular experiments demonstrated the ability of man to perform useful work in space. Because of this, man has progressed notably along the path to the moon and beyond.